Good evening. Welcome to the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology Archaeology Month celebration. Tonight we're very fortunate to have Dr. Chris Moore. He's going to talk about the early life on the southeastern coastal plain. So in order not to get this wrong, I want to read some of his accomplishments and give him a little setup so that he can come in here and talk to us tonight. But before I begin, I want to give a special thanks to the North Carolina Archaeological Society and the North Carolina Archaeological Council for helping us support this event. And I guess I should say that I'm John Mintz, and I'm the state archaeologist, and I'm very privileged to work at the Office of State Archaeology with some very fine individuals. Dr. Chris Moore is a geoarchaeologist at the Savannah River Archaeological Research Program. His research interests include site formation processes, dating of stratified sites on the southeastern coastal plain, paleoenvironment reconstruction, early hunter-gatherer adaptations, lithic technology, and most recently, immunolunicosia, immun immun yeah, yeah, blood residue analysis. That word will not <laughs> come. Time, yeah, that's a hard word. Blood residue analysis, which he did use some of our collection for, for that analysis. Uh, Dr. Moore's recent publications include an article in American Antiquity where he and his co-authors identified ancient animal blood residues from paleo Indian stone tools in South Carolina and Georgia. In 2017, Dr. Moore was a lead author of a paper in Nature Scientific Reports that provide evidence of a possible global extraterrestrial impact of fragmented comet at the end of the paleo Indian Clovis period. While this work is ongoing, the proposed impact may have altered the climate system affecting both human and animal populations and possibly contributing to the extension, extension of ice age animals or megafauna. More recently, Dr. Moore and Dr. Al Goodyear co-edited the book, Early Human Life on the Southeastern Coastal Plain, which is down here to my right, your left, uh, recently published by the University Press of Florida. Earlier this year, Dr. Moore initiated the White Pond Human Paleoecology Project at White Pond in Elgin, South Carolina. This project involves multiple colleagues and specialists examining evidence from both geologic cores with archaeological investigations to link the early prehistoric human record with periods of climatic change recorded in lake sediments over the last 13,000 years. Now, Dr. Moore went to Appalachian State University as an undergrad, a very fine university. Many of us here attended that. And then he made his way east to East Carolina University, took an MA in anthropology, archaeology, studied under Randy Daniels. And then he moved up from that into the PhD program where he received his doctorate at the Coastal Resource Management Program and did an awful lot of work on relic sand dunes and geoarchaeology. So we're very fortunate to have Dr. Moore here tonight. Um, we have some Archaeology Month posters to my left, your right. And at the conclusion of this presentation, Dr. Moore will be happy to answer any of your questions. So please help me welcome Dr. Christopher Moore. Thank you. Thank you All right. I appreciate the invitation to come speak tonight. Um, I've got a lot of slides, a lot of different topics to go through, so I'm going to go ahead and get, a, get started on this. Uh, let's see. So just pre by way of presentation overview, I'm going to go over many things. Oops. What did I do? There it is. Uh, we'll go very briefly over time periods in prehistory, uh, the peopling of North America as we now understand it, background on Pleistocene megafauna environments, blood residue analysis, which John mentioned. Uh, I'll t talk about my work with the Clovis comet, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. We'll discuss, you know, were megafauna hunted by Clovis in the southeast, and then finally the archaeological and paleoenvironmental work that I've done at White Pond. So this is a chart I put together a few years ago. Shows the different time periods, the Paleo-Indian period. You got your time scale here on the left in calendar years. So just people who are not familiar with our conventional time periods for the Paleo-Indian, there's the Paleo-Indian period, 13.5 to 11,450. Archaic period, 11,450 to 3,200. Woodland period, 3,200 to 1,000. Of course, Mississippian and historic, which I'm not gonna get into that at all. Uh, the, this image and poster is actually available in one of the books I did with Tommy Charles on South Carolina projectile points. Uh, if you're interested in that book, we can talk about that later. So to jump into it, who were the first people to colonize North America and when and how did they do it? Traditional view of people in North America, as you all know, the, the Bering Land Bridge. Let me go back. Um, here we have the, from Siberia during the Low Ice Age, uh, during the low sea level during the Ice Age. 
crossing of the Bering Land Bridge, uh, the spread of people out of Asia over Beringia down the so-called ice-free corridor through the glacial ice sheet that's, that's separated from the Cordelian and Laurentide ice sheet, and the rapid spread of Clovis technology and culture over North America roughly from 13.5 to 13,000, and that date is always in flux, but something like that. Here's some nice images I got from Dave Anderson that kind of show the extent of the ice sheet 21,000 years ago. See Beringia in Russia. This is the area that would have been exposed when all the sea ice was, uh, had sucked up all the water of the oceans in this massive ice sheet here. At 16,500 years ago, it's starting to, starting to melt, starting to retreat. Um, possibly by 13,750. This is also in, in recent dispute. Uh, we had this ice-free corridor open up uh, that might have allowed people coming across Beringia to move down into the lower 48. There's some dispute over this as to whether or not this was actually open in time for Clovis people to come through or the descendants or ancestors of Clovis to come through or whether it, been, it would have been viable for people to come through. In other words, it would have, had, uh, it would have been open long enough to have plants and animals that would have allowed them to actually come down through that corridor. You can see that a little off the map here, we've got the Clovis and Folsom sites in New Mexico. Uh, in 1927, this was the first time archaeologists identified uh, ancient Folsom Point early, uh, uh, in association with extinct bison bones. Uh, and this was the first time we realized that we had these really early sites in North America. Uh, this map did not come out very well. This is, this is North America here, but the migration routes that people are talking about the traditional route across the Bering Land Bridge, right? But now, and more recently, there's a lot of evidence now for a coastal migration route uh, using boats, hopping along the, uh, the, the land, moving down, following along the, the west coast, coming along California, and then making their way down in South America, the famous Monte Verde site uh, that maybe is also a, a potential pre-Clovis site. Uh, you've also got ideas Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley have been talking about for a European transatlantic migration following the ice sheet. The ice sheet that not only extended across North America, but extended across the North Atlantic. And so Dennis Stanford has argued that these European uh, uh, hunter-gatherers from the Salutrian time period were actually moving along the edge of the ice sheet. Very controversial idea, uh, but there is some possibility that groups may be able to come across this way as, as well. North America 13,000 years ago, uh, we've got fluted points, uh, greater than 1,500 locations mapped in the, the PID database by Dave Anderson and his students. Here's some beautiful Clovis points, these beautiful lancelet spear points that are just incredible. This one's from, actually I photographed uh, from uh, over in Georgia across the Savannah River, this beautiful uh, redstone point with this large flute that moves up the uh, way up the middle of the point here. So we have chains through time. So we have, oops, we have Clovis here, again, a, a widespread across the continent, uh, almost instantaneously from 13.2 to 12.9. In the western U.S., after 12.9, we have the Folsom complex, slightly different with these full fluted type forms. In the east, we have eastern Folsom, we have Redstone, which I'll talk about. Remember the Redstone point, which Al Goodyear talks about for South Carolina. It seems to be the point that, at least in South Carolina and Virginia and Georgia, is the point that, that we normally find that appears to be immediately post-Clovis, immediately after uh, their initial colonization by the Clovis people across North America. This is some data I put together for uh, Randy Daniel and Al Goodyear for a publication. We took collector data that uh, Dr. Randy Daniel and Al Goodyear had amassed for, for many years over the Carolinas and actually amass that into a GIS database that would allow us to look at the distribution, interpolated distribution of various um, types of points by raw material. Uh, here I've just got a few examples. Here are Allendale Chert Clovis points distribution for South Carolina. Here's Redstone distribution, very similar, focused on those Allendale Chert quarries on the Savannah River. Here's the metavolcanic stone distribution, a lot of it from Dr. Randy Daniels' data. You can see in North Carolina we have this major sort of Piedmont-focused distribution, fall line distribution coming down. Would it, the meta, interesting thing at metavolcanic point seemed to extend further into South Carolina 
then the Allendale Chert extends into North Carolina. We see very little Allendale Chert, Clovis, or anything else occurring in North Carolina. Here we have the redstone point with these very long uh, flutes that in some cases can travel all the way up the blade. We, these are assumed to be immediately post-Clovis. We really didn't have any dates on these, possibly until recently Joe McAvoy at Cactus Hill released a report. He's he describes these deeply incurvate base uh, points with these long flutes. He's got dates on them that possibly uh, put it right at the very end of Clovis, maybe just slightly later than Clovis. So those are really the first dates that, are, that we really can tie possibly, possibly to redstone points. But you can see the metavolcanic distribution has this really interesting fall line distribution, which is kind of interesting because the, the Clovis distribution was a much broader distribution, and the artifacts immediately post-Clovis during the redstone times seem to really con contract and constrict, and for whatever reason, they're focused on the fall line area of both North and South Carolina. So North America 15,000 years ago, these would be the pre-Clovis sites, right? There's been a lot of evidence in recent times that we've got pre-Clovis. Uh, apparently not, not too many people around, but with their sites certainly like Topper and Cactus Hill. We have Metacroft Rock Shelter, one of the early sites that was purported to be pre-Clovis at 19,000. This was almost done, uh, Jim Adavazio did this almost too early. People were not willing to accept pre-Clovis at this time. So there was a lot of, lot of controversy, a lot of debate that still goes on about Metacroft. Cactus Hill in Virginia, I worked there with Tom White in the, in the mid-90s. They got these small little triangular points that appear to be to date to roughly uh, 20,000 calibrated years ago. Paige Ladson was published in Science Advances recently by Jessica Halligan and Mike Waters. This appears to be a pre-Clovis point type dating to 14,500 years ago. These are calibrated years. Uh, in Florida. And of course, Darren Lowry and Dennis Stanford have worked on Delmarva Peninsula sites, and they're finding all kinds of incredible stuff uh, that really don't have a good handle on because most of what they're finding is coming out of these eroding bluffs along the Delmarva Peninsula that are just eroding at an exceedingly high rate. We're losing the sites, we're losing the artifacts. Uh, very controversial. Uh, of course, these are the, one, these are the sites that Dennis Stanford, of course, is tied to possible Salutrian European connection. Whatever they are, there's something really interesting going on there because they're buried within soils two and a half meters down that have been dated multiple times with AMS to roughly 20,000 years ago. So we're looking at last glacial maximum time period for whatever these artifacts are. And of course, the Sinmar site which was off the continental shelf, off of Maryland. They, they were dredging. They pulled up this beautiful bipointed artifact that Dennis Stanford says looks like a Salutrian artifact from France or Spain, right? So this is very controversial. The context is dubious, but these, these are things that are being reported and maybe it's something worth looking at. So one thing I like to go into whenever I talk to groups, I talk to kids, I talk to all kinds of archeological societies I like to really explain that uh, the Pleistocene environment during the LGM in North America, radically different flora and fauna than we have now. As recently as the LGM 20,000 years ago, North America rivaled Africa in regard to large megafauna, or mega beast. By 12,800 years ago, more than 35 genres of these animals were extinct. This isn't even showing all of them. And so these are just incredible diversity of these large animals, giant ground sloths, mastodon, mammoth, camels, just really incredible species. And I always tell people if you could bring a, a Paleo-Indian, you know, pull them into the current time frame, they would, they would look around and see a, a devastated environment, you know, missing all of these primary, these really, you know, important animals for the ecology and environment that they were used to seeing. We had, we had horse in the late Pleistocene. Horses didn't come back after the extinction you know, at least by 12,800 years ago, the horses were gone along with all the other animals. They didn't return until uh, they were introduced by the Spanish in 1519. We've got Mastodon. Oops. Shown with a modern African elephant by comparison. Saber-toothed cat. These are the kind of animals, you know, as if you're a Paleo-Indian, you probably don't want to run into these guys, right? 
giant short-faced bear. This was a black bear, modern black bear. This was a grizzly bear. And this is a giant short-faced bear by comparison. So a uh, pretty dangerous environment for these people to be living in at that time. Giant beaver, right? Pleistocene beaver, right? The size of black bear. Can you imagine? I know people who have to go down and, like, and get in, you know, the beavers dam up, you know, and, sp and floods people's, you know, property, and they have to go in and do something about it. Can you imagine what these guys were doing? Camels, right? When I heard this years ago, I was like, wow, camels? You just never, people don't think about that we had camels in North America, right? That's in the desert, you know, out the Middle East or something, right? So, <clears throat> the question is, did early hunter-gatherers really hunt and kill these megafauna on a regular basis? Lacking bone, in many cases, in the south southeast, we don't have bone, so is there any way to tell? So, immunological analysis, which John had trouble pronouncing, and I often do, is a method that can be applied success successfully to detect residues on stone tools. Many have said, is this, science, this really science, or is this science fiction? Well, I'm an archaeologist, right? I'm not an immunologist, um, but I looked into this a few years ago. This really caught my attention. And so what are we looking at? We're looking at protein residues that are found on stone tools, right? The method here is called, bear with me, crossover immunoelectrophoresis, right? And it's used in forensic medicine for 50 years. Uh, it started about 25 years ago. The method was experimentally applied to the analysis of protein residues or blood residue uh, preserved on and more likely within stone tools, right? And there's been experiments you know, we're not talking about blood stains on tools. That's gone. But my, when you do, when the when their flint nappers are producing stone tools, they're producing micro fractures within the rock. And under experimentation, that's shown that those micro fractures can absorb blood residues through capillary uptake into the into the micro fractures, and that's probably how they're being preserved. So CIEP, this long word here, I won't say again. Uh, uses, uses antisera derived from living animals to test for proteins, or another word called linear epitopes, extracted from the stone tool microfractures, and, they, and to get a positive or negative reaction, depending on if that protein residue is actually there in the tool. So I said, okay, let's, let's have a look. And I've, I've done a lot of work at Flamingo Bay. It's a Carolina Bay in South Carolina. I've worked on with Mark Brooks and others for a long time. And we worked on the sand rim over here. So we went in. Here, here we have in 2010 one of our field techs. <clears throat> he didn't know what he had at first, but quickly realized he had a beautiful Clovis point, base of a Clovis from Flamingo Bay we excavated. It's probably made from this exotic green uh, welded vitric tuff that looks like material from, north, from uh, Asheboro, uh, North Carolina. Possibly, you know, again, possibly, you know, likely from North Carolina. It's the first Clovis recovered from buried contacts within a Carolina Bay sand rim. This didn't come out too well, but we, we did a lot of work. These are the block excavations. And we identified many early archaic and Paleo-Indian artifacts uh, from Flamingo Bay over several years of excavations. Here we are with our field crew, the Savannah River Archaeological Program, excavating at Flamingo Bay. And so we said, let's go out, let's excavate artifacts, but let's not touch them, right? And can you imagine digging with people and they find a beautiful spear point or something and they can't touch it, right? That caused some, some problem, the consternation among, but, you know, we didn't touch it, we didn't wash it, we got this stuff in situ, right? And we sent this stuff off for blood residue because we didn't want to have any kind of contamination. We wanted to know that they hadn't been touched. You know, and, and there was no issues with contamination. So we had this large, beautiful, half to, this beautiful scraper knife uh, that we excavated, probably Paleo-Indian. And right away, we come back with this incredible result of the bovid or bison uh, blood residue on this tool, right, which I thought was pretty cool. So we, we continued with that, and uh, we got a whole series of artifacts, including uh, additional Paleo-Indian, Artifacts including Clovis, Redstone, Dalton, Early Archaic, Middle Archaic, Moore Mountains, Late Archaic, and then Woodland Mississippian. We tested a whole suite of these 
for various, you know, using the different antisera to see what we could find. And right away we were getting numerous bison. The one, the one thing I wanted to emphasize, early and often the Paleo-Indian artifacts have bison along with, and, and cat, which is kind of interesting if you think about ecologically. If you've got herds of bison around in the early Pleistocene, in the late Pleistocene, you're probably going to have animals that are, you know, um, uh, predatory to those, to those bison. So that kind of makes sense ecologically that we're getting cat. And that extends into the early archaic. Uh, we did, we continued, we did 60 more artifacts. We initially tested 75, we got these results. We tested uh, 60 more artifacts and we increased our sample size. We only get about 20% positive residues on the tools, give or take. Uh, but, we all, but this became a really obvious pattern that Paleo-Indian guys are soon to be, they're going after bison. Uh, the early archaic people are to some extent, and even the middle archaic people. But we've tested stuff since, and we've, got, we've yet to find any evidence of bison after the mid-Holocene. So after, you know, 7,500 years ago, or something in that we don't we have yet to find any evidence of bison, which kind of makes sense. We think about, you know, we have very little bone preservation, but where we do have bone preservation tends to be in this time period here from the later archaic on. So we don't have any bison bones that I've ever heard of in the Carolinas or Georgia or Virginia that's defended to bison bones. But that kind of makes sense if they're gone, if they're not around. And so, you know, we need to do some more testing to see if, if bison do they go extinct in the mid-Holocene during this Mara Mountain time frame? And of course, the other thing that's missing there, glaringly missing, any extinct megafauna, right? Right? There's no, where's the mastodon? Where's the mammoth? So all these images of Paleo-Indians, you know, slaughtering and killing, you know, mastodons and mammoth. We have yet to find any evidence of it. Doesn't mean it's not there, but we just maybe need to test more artifacts. Here's a schematic that I showed, again, that shows the Paleo-Indian artifacts and, uh, the, and the types of animals. Rabbit, believe it or not, is really common on, 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 on any of the tools we've tested. And we think, in many cases, the rabbit, uh, based on some of the people we've talked to, primitive technologists, the sinew and blood and skin from rabbits is very useful in the hafting of tools. <coughs> so they're very common, and they would, they would be used maybe on a lot of the tools in the actual hafting process. Uh, and then, of course, we've got tools like this clovis here that's got cat, rabbit, and bison on the same tool, which is kind of interesting. Some of these may relate to hafting at, you know, uh, at the base of the uh, artifact where it was put into the foreshaft, and some of these may relate to the actual the hunting of some of the remaining herds of bison. Very recently, I was uh, lucky enough to get a collection of the Oshinok collection. Bob and, and Jim Oshinok who live in North Carolina, donated this incredible collection to the Office of State Archaeology. Just incredible number of, of beautiful Paleo-Indian points that they documented precisely their locations they were found in plowed fields. And we tested 30 of those using the same technique. Uh, and we were able to come back again, bison. You know, something that we see over and over again when we test Paleo-Indian tools, right? Of course, deer and rabbit, bear, kind of interesting. Uh, most of them didn't produce anything, but that's common. Probably has something to do with preservation. These artifacts come, are coming out of a plow zone context. They're probably being exposed to a lot of weathering and that kind of thing. So data from blood residue analysis of, of the stone tools that I've done so far suggest that bison were heavily targeted. You know, based on the limited sample we've tested and the number of bison blood residues that we've got, it indicates they were heavily targeted. Uh, during the Paleo-Indian period and especially continued into the early archaic and into the middle archaic to some degree. There's no bison residues after 7,500 years ago, around the time of Mar Mountain, and there's no evidence of large extinct species have yet to be found. So one of the things that kind of struck me, and you know, we don't know the answer, <clears throat> but is it possible that some megafauna were already extinct in portions of the southeast prior to Clovis? I've, I've talked about this with my colleagues. Many of the supposed kill sites that have mastodon and mammoth, at least outside of Florida, and maybe even in Florida, really, are not necessarily associated with Clovis. There's evidence that they're really associated with pre-Clovis. Coates Hines is a good example in Tennessee. Again, the jury's out on that, if those are real artifacts. You know, you've heard the story before 
that kind of thing. But there, there's some evidence that maybe the pre-Clovis people here uh, maybe were the ones that were hunting or doing most of the hunting, at least in the east, of some of the extinct megafauna. So what was responsible for the extinction of so many Ice Age animals? At least 14 megafauna kill sites dating to 13,000 BP are currently known in North America. At least that, that's the latest that I've gotten, right? Not very many, but they're dating right to the time of extinction. It's kind of odd that we, the ones that are found quite often are found, they tend to date right at the event where they, they appear to go extinct. <clears throat> so were early Paleo-Indians responsible for the extinction of megafauna, including more than 35 genre of animals, right? That's always been a big question in archaeology, big debates going on. The overkill hypothesis by Paul Martin, uh, Surville and others have actually come out, believe it or not, this actually went out of favor. People say, well, there's no way, right? How could these small bands of hunter-gatherers come in and wipe out all of these animals across the entire continent, right? But there's actually some evidence that's been presented, at least in peer review, it kind of supports that again. I'm not sure that I buy it, uh, but, you know, but many don't believe it and th don't think humans alone could have done the job. So if Paleo-Indians didn't kill off megafauna, what did? Could something else, could something else have caused the extinction? So the Younger Dryas Climate Event, many of you may have heard about. This is a temperature graph over the last 15,000 years. We're coming out of the Ice Age, 15,000. And then we go into a very warm period, uh, just, just around the time of Clovis, just before Clovis. Temperatures warm up. We've got Clovis people moving around everywhere, bulling Alley Rod time period. And then at the end of Clovis, around 12,800 years ago, the bottom drops out. We have this major climate event called the Younger Dryas. It gets colder in, you know, 1,000 years, 1,200 years, uh, we are in this climate event, very rapidly move into it, and we come out of it. So the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis was proposed by Firestone, and he's got, we're finding magnetic microspirals that indicate a possible extraterrestrial comet or impact at this time may be responsible. We've got nanodiamonds, we go back, carbon spirals, platinum group elements, we've got melt glass that's being found at some of these Younger Dryas sites, uh, high, te uh, high temperature melt glass, we've got Al Goodyear and Dave Anderson have suggested there was a population decline immediately following Clovis. We have the age of the younger, the YDB is the younger Dryas boundary, that lower boundary when we find those in archaeological sites, the, the initial onset of that major climate event is the younger Dryas boundary. And then we have YDB impact proxies as a potential datum layer. And so now, this is actually out of date, but even a few years ago, there were 42 sites on four continents with a distribution of YDB impact proxies, including microspirals, nanodiamonds, all of these things, milk glass, platinum group elements. And so the idea was Jim Kennett and others, very well respected uh, glaciologists, and oceanographers, uh, suggested that there may have been an extraterrestrial impact of the North American ice sheet. The ice sheet over North America uh, certainly at that time had retreated but in places was several kilometers thick, a massive ice sheet. If you have an impact into that, it might have penetrated through, but it might not left a crater. But we think it threw up terrestrial material uh, from the Earth's surface. It created these microspirals that we find in younger dry sites. Under an SEM microscope, this is from Squires Ridge on the Tall River, one of the sites I worked on for my dissertation. This is a beautiful image of a microspiral that I extracted from sediments there that date to around the time of the Younger Dryas. These are incredible, They're just to look at. I mean, they're under an SEM. They have these what's called dendritic crystalline textures, which indicate they were melted and then rapidly cooled, right? And, and the elements that have been detected in these indicate very high temperature uh, melting had to occur. What's interesting about this, there's, this is a little hole in this thing. This thing is, an egg, is eggshell thin. And some people have, have called it, I've heard uh, my colleague Malcolm LeCompte refer to it as iron bubbles or iron vapor. Of course, these are very small, 20 micron or slightly bigger. Here are some other microspirals from Squires Ridge we analyzed under the SEM. You see a variety of surface textures. <coughs> Many of them to me look like planets. 
you know, or moons around Jupiter or something, you know, really incredible, you know, images. So the Younger Dryas layer of ice was looked at and said, okay, there's, a, there's evidence of an impact. Uh, we, Jim, uh, Mo, uh, some of the glaciologists said, we know there's an area on the edge of the Greenland ice sheet, there's a dusty layer that they know dates to the beginning of the, all of this is at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. So they went out, they didn't have the core data, you know, they drilled cores into the ice, but they went out to the edge of the ice sheet, found the dusty layer and collected samples through the ice. And what they found is at the base of this ice, they found a peak in nano diamonds, which are microscopic diamonds, which are formed under very high temperature, high pressure events, such as catastrophic extraterrestrial impacts. There really isn't any other known uh, source for these. Here are some images. Here's one from the Greenland ice core, where they were first found. Here's Murray Springs in Arizona. Uh, they're just full of nano diamonds. So what other proxies may indicate an ET impact? 2013, a team published results from Greenland showing a large platinum anomaly with an ice dating to the Younger Dryas. The, you know, the Greenland ice core is sort of the gold standard for paleoclimatology. It doesn't get better than that, right? They drill down through these massive, deep cores. They find they have these interannual layers of ice, and they can go in and can, they can precisely date uh, where they know where they're at. They can analyze the ice. Anything that's coming out of the atmosphere is going to be in there, right? And when they looked, they actually went in thinking they were going to debunk the ET, the extraterrestrial impact. And they were looking for iridium. Iridium is associated with the dinosaur killing event, right? It's another rare earth element like platinum. Well, they didn't find iridium or not much, but they found a huge spike in platinum, which is also known to be common in asteroids and comets. So given that, I embarked on a study with a bunch of colleagues and said, you know, if it was in the ice, these uh, the proxies for an extraterrestrial impact should be in archaeological sites. I had sediment samples from the work I'd done for my dissertation along the Tar River archived. I already had many of them ready to go. And so we tested the samples for platinum. We had AMS dates. We had OSL dates. We had the archaeology. We knew about where the younger dry should be. And so we wanted to see, or is that platinum anomaly there? Is it consistent with what's been found in the Greenland ice core? And so in the study, we document 11 archaeological sites across North America that have platinum anomalies from stratified sequences dating to the onset of the Younger Dryas, all the way from California, New Mexico, Arizona, Ohio, and then these are all the sites I worked on from dissertation work and then work since I've been at the Savannah River site in South Carolina. So platinum is rare in the Earth crust, but common, common in asteroids and comets. Here's a view from Arlington Canyon. The blue line shows platinum. You get down to the younger, driest dated sediments, and you have this huge spike in platinum, right where it ought to be. And so we, said, we went to the topper site. that worked with Al Goodyear. Uh, down, he's got a beautiful Clovis occupation there. Uh, excuse me, over here. Uh, we've got early archaic points above. We've got Clovis preforms, Clovis blades, microblades. In this layer here, we've got a platinum anomaly. At the Kolb site on the Petey River, Chris Judge and Carl Steen have worked there for years. Beautiful sequence here with OSL dates. We've got a platinum anomaly, very large platinum anomaly, bracketed by OSL dates that fits perfectly with where the younger dry sediment should be. Flamingo Bay, which I showed you earlier for the blood residue, we have an off-the-charts platinum anomaly, uh, right where the Clovis artifacts are located. Right? This, is fact, this is the largest platinum anomaly that we've recorded in North America. It's almost 40. Again, we're talking about parts per billion, but still we're looking at almost 40 parts per billion. <coughs> Squires Ridge, uh, one of the, it's the only one that I've tested that has multiple platinum anomalies. Uh, some of them are clearly in post-Younger Dryas, Younger Sediments. But, but the earliest ones are in sediments that are well constrained and dated to the initial Younger Dryas. We really never find them below that. We never find them in older sediments. And we think we can explain this through bioturbation, through uh, wind-blown sand, aeolian uh, reworking of sediments. It's going to rework and move some of that stuff up into the higher profiles. Barbara Creek, working with Randy Daniel for many years at, on the Tar River here. Again, we've got well-dated OSL, radiocarbon dates of the Younger Dryas. We've got a large platinum anomaly there. So again, 
pretty much everywhere I'm looking, including additional sites I'm working on in Florida and elsewhere, I'm finding the same thing. So what could be responsible for producing a continent-wide platinum anomaly? A recent study indicates there have been 26 nuclear-scale asteroid explosions in Earth's atmosphere between 2001 and 2013. The most powerful of the impacts was dozens of times the magnitude of the atom bomb and devastated Hiroshima, Japan in 1945. We, didn't, we have all these centers around the world to detect when North Korea detonates a nuclear weapon, right? Well, the bonus to that is they're, they're all suddenly able to hear the, you know, the explosions from these uh, smaller meteoroids and, and comets that hit the atmosphere. Most of them explode high in the atmosphere. They don't, they don't do any damage. They may go into the ocean. But what we've learned from this is, whoops, is that we're being hit about 10 times more than we expected, right? So you, some of you may remember 94, the Shoemaker, Shoemaker Levy 9 comet broke apart due to the gravitational perturbations from Jupiter. It, it stretched it, it pulled it apart, and then it sucked it into Jupiter. This was the first time humans have ever witnessed the impact of a comet uh, with another planet. You guys, y'all didn't know I was going to talk about astronomy, right? But, um, but, you know, these things are really relevant. And what's really cool is we've learned that Jupiter gets hit uh, by objects quite a bit. And thankfully for us, it does because it acts like a vacuum cleaner for the solar system and sucks all these materials into Jupiter rather than hitting us. It's probably why we are still around. Just as an example, here's one of the impacts. I actually watched, I could see this through my telescope in 94. You could see the impacts. Not like this, but I could see it. And, that's, that's one of the impacts that uh, scaled to the Earth. Uh, if Shoemaker Levy 9 had impacted the Earth, that would have been a very bad day. Probably greater than what we may have experienced during the Younger Dryas. Estimated to have released an energy equivalent of 6 million megatons of TNT. So these are massive explosions hitting at very high velocity, huge amounts of energy released. And of course, on Jupiter, these are they're exploding in the atmosphere. There's no crater that's being produced on Jupiter. And so this may have been actually what happened here. We don't know yet. We haven't found a crater. We don't have the smoking gun for the Clovis Comet, which has been one of the, the critics have pointed out. But, you know, we, we actually may have had a series of these Tunguska style. You heard of the Tunguska 1908 uh, events uh, that just flattened trees for, for hundreds of miles, right? But it exploded in the atmosphere. And so the thermal shock and the shock wave came out and, and burnt some of the trees, but mostly just pushed them down, right? And that released equivalent of 15 million tons of TNT. So the Younger Dryas impact, if it occurred, might have been a series of commentary impacts possibly into the ice sheet. Made, made, was evident, we're getting evidence now that there were other areas, including South America, where we're finding these things. So there might have been airbursts like this over North America. So there might have been a series of explosions, series of airbursts, globally that we're only just beginning to learn about. So, okay, let's get back to some archaeology and, and right in people. What, what effect, if any, did the Younger Dryas impact, if it occurred, it's still being debated, it's controversial. If it happened, what effect did it have on early Paleo Indians, right? Well, some of the work by Dave Anderson, they've looked at some of the large quarry sites, some of you may know the Topper site, this large chert quarry in South Carolina on the Savannah River, Carson Con Short, Tennessee, Adams, Kentucky. These are large uh, quarry sites of very good material uh, that were used extensively by Clovis. And the evidence so far indicates that following the Younger Dryas, at the very end of Clovis, around 12.9, 12.8, 12.9, there's a massive decline in the use of these quarries. There's another, I don't know if they would call it an abandonment, but there seems to be much less use being going on at least temporarily at these quarries. We also see when we look at the, uh, for the, the PIDBA database, which is probably, this is probably out of date, but you can see these are Clovis artifacts uh, and that are uh, the numbers of Clovis that have been documented. And then you have the Younger Dryas and you have this massive decline in redstone and other post-Clovis forms which indicate maybe there was some decline possibly in uh, demographic crash in population or movement of people, possibly as a result of some environmental calamity. You know, we don't know. And then a return. And then by Dalton times, huge explosion in population. Everything has come back to normal. 
Dr. Goodyear has been documenting Clovis points in South Carolina, and Randy Daniels done the same thing, and he's noted there's roughly four and a half Clovis points to every redstone, right? So, and in, in in this is just for South Carolina in North Carolina, but uh, the redstones, you know, seem to really, there seems to be a lot fewer of them. So the, the artifact, the, the spear point that we associate with immediately post Clovis, we don't find that many of relative to Clovis. So what happened to Clovis? Really, what happened, right? Do we know? Well, n no, we don't, we really don't. Uh, did they move somewhere? Did they move somewhere with better environment, better conditions? We just don't know. There's a, this is an ongoing research. It's controversial. Uh, there may be many factors, including climate, uh, at the end of the ice age, you know, that affected people, that affected megafauna. Uh, we just don't know. Did, did an extraterrestrial impact contribute to those extinctions? Did an extraterrestrial impact contribute to the decline, temporary decline in human populations? Those are questions that are up in the air. And we don't, simply don't know the answer yet. But there's been a whole flurry of papers that have come out that really dealing with that, including more actually coming out fairly soon. And so I want to close here with a project that I started last year with colleagues uh, uh, Mark Brooks and Al Goodyear and Terry Ferguson. We started the White Pine Human Paleoecology Project in South Carolina. Uh, White Pond is a natural lake situated along the western edge of the upper coastal plain north of Columbia near Elgin. Bobby uh, was kind enough to come out and help us this year, and, and uh, we appreciate that. Bobby and Don's work out there with us. Uh, we've had other, many other people have really helped us on this. It's really been a collaborative project. We've used avocational archaeologists, volunteers. Here's a LIDAR image showing White Pond. White Pond is famous uh, in the 1980s. It was one of the first pollen studies by Watts that really documented climate change uh, for the southeast over the last 20,000 years. And there hadn't been any work done since, since then. So we went back with a lot of the questions that we have about paleo environment and how that relates to early hunter-gatherers. And we went in with some colleagues of mine from East Carolina University, uh, Dave Mallinson, uh, and his colleague, South Carolina DNR, or Sean Taylor, was really helped out a lot. But we got a, this was a vibracore. You stick it in and it just vibrates its way down through the sediments. And then you wind up with something like this. And so you split it open and you have these layers of sediments that go back, you know, thousands of years. So this is really like a time capsule. You know, you talk about archaeological sites as a time capsule, but this is a lacustrian, a lake setting with very slow sedimentation, very layers of, of sediments being laid down. This is as close as we can get to an ice core. The ice, the ice core is the gold standard for paleoclimatology. Lake records like this is, are sort of the next level, right? And so we got this vibracore. We want to do some work on it. Here's the entire core. This is the this is the water interface up here. The water and this is the these are this is peat, peaty deposits. It's got these wonderful dark layers of uh, that we haven't looked at yet that might represent periods of drought or fire. So we're really we're really excited to look at that and date that. This whole section here is the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, and we and we're only just beginning to look at this, right? So we got this incredible record of 10,000 years of climate history just waiting to be analyzed. We have the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, right? That's the ice age, the end of the ice age transition to our modern climate, which has the Clovis people. It has the possible data that might uh, tell us something about the extinction event that goes on here, right? So we have the Paleo-Indian time period here. We've got sections of the core that relate to the Archaic and to the Woodland period, Mississippian period. It's all there. So all of this can be related directly back to some paleo-environmental research directly back to archaeological questions. And this is a section of core we've been focused on the last couple of years for our research. So much of the work we've been doing, you might have guessed, uh, work on the sediment core from White Pond, I wanted to look at a higher resolution record from a lake to see if I could replicate the platinum anomalies. If we could find a platinum anomaly in the lake core, we could get very precise radiocarbon dates, we could nail it, we could really say, that it happened at the beginning of the Younger Dryas climate event. So that's one of the major research avenues that we're looking at. We're hoping to publish on that early, early 2019. Uh, Angie Perotti, who was a grad student at Texas A&M, uh, looked at uh, some of the samples from our core where we've got, and she found Sporomyella, 
which are dung spores or dung fun fungi that are found primarily within the poop of mastodons and mammoths and other large mega herbivores, right? What a, what a, what a field, right? You know, people study coprolites, right? But she's looking at spores that are predominantly, their whole life cycle was within the dung of these large mega herbivores. This has been used elsewhere in other environments and they've been able to show that there's a big, uh, large amounts of spore miella in the late, in the ice age period. And then at the end of, at the end of the ice age, that plummets and it likely indicates the extinction event. We have a guy, a pre-HD student, I'll send samples to uh, Josh uh, Kapp at the Paleogenomics Laboratory at UC Santa Cruz. He is currently working very diligently and very hard to extract DNA out of the mud, right? Some of you may have heard of the work um, by the Max Planck Institute in Europe. They went into a cave and were able to extract, there were no bones or Neanderthals or Denisovans in there, but they were able to find Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in the sediments, right? Using this, the technology for DNA extraction, for sequencing, for looking at tiny, tiny fragments of DNA is just, it's science fiction level now. It's really, it's gonna revolutionize archeology. span And so I've got really high hopes that, that Josh is gonna be able to look at those samples and say, yeah, we've, had, we've got the spores, but they, what, what animals are really leaving those spores? I mean, other animals can leave the spores, but the DNA will be definitive if we can find DNA. And not only that, well, here we go. Here I am in the lab trying to, I'm taking the cord. I've got a, I've got a, you can't, I've got a face mask on. I've, we've sterilized everything. We've got, uh, I'm wearing gloves because the first time I sent samples, we weren't really thinking about, we were taking samples for chemistry. We said, hey, we'll send these samples and let them try to find DNA. Well, they found DNA, all right. They found my DNA. <laughs> so I contaminated the crap out of these things. But, and so that, they told me what to do, and I went back, and I, and I followed the protocol, and, and I did everything I could to extract a core from sediment plug from the center of the core that would not be contaminated with my DNA or anybody else. They're currently looking at these samples uh, in conjunction with the spore data to try to find if there's any DNA preserved uh, in this core. And here you go, you can see a section of the core. Again, here's the younger Dryas interval here, late Pleistocene, uh, the spore data is over here. Do we have evidence of Macedon and Mammoth at White Pond? We don't know yet. Uh, but you can see hopefully uh, these are all DNA samples. And so hopefully within a few weeks I'm going to get some evidence. He, I, I was in touch with them recently, and they, they sequence these samples, and they come back with hundreds of thousands and millions of, of DNA fragments, you know, just vast, vast data set. It probably includes bacteria and fungus and everything else that's in there, and they have to use computers and these DNA libraries to try to find these tiny fragments of, of megafauna DNA that may or may not be preserved in here. So it's really incredible science that the, that's going on here. We also have an archaeological component at White Pond. This is on the, on the slopes overlooking the lake. Uh, we started in 2016. There's Al Goodyear and Sean Taylor. Uh, some of you may know Tark, Jafar, the DNR folks have been a huge help along with Bobby and, and Dawn at White Pond. Uh, in 2016 we did some work there, opened up several large blocks. It's, it's just pure sand. Right, we've got a really deep sand. We've got artifacts down over a meter deep in places. And I was lucky enough to get in and come up with a beautiful in situ Dalton point, ortho quartzite Dalton. You can kind of see it there. You know, when you find those things, it kind of makes your day, you know? So Sean, Sean Taylor, you mean Sean. Sean was digging for me, you know, and, and I said, Sean, you know, get out. I'll, I'll, give, I'll, you know, I'll give you a break. I'll get in and dig a little bit. So he hops out, and I'm scraping along, and boom, there, there it is, right? So <laughs> he wasn't real happy with me, but, um, but that's the luck of the draw, right? But we actually, this isn't reported. Uh, we actually talked about this in Legacy, which is a newsletter th from the South Carolina Institute, but we tested this artifact for blood residue. Bobby helped us with this, and Don helped us with this. This one came back with human blood residue. <laughs> we never touched it. We never washed it. We didn't do anything. You know, we, we, we did as carefully as we could do. We scooped it up, threw it in a bag, uh, sent it for analysis. So either, you know, many of you know when people are flint napping, they cut themselves. 
that's a possibility, right? Um, or maybe, maybe a, a, a murder weapon. So we have a, a murder scene, a 12,000-year-old murder scene. Who, who knows? But uh, that's the first one that we've got back with human blood residue. So a future archaeological field work at White Pond. Again, we're going to search for evidence of early Paleo-Indian, particularly Clovis occupations. We don't have any evidence of that yet, although I feel like it's got to be there. White Pond, we know, goes back based on previous work 20,000 years. And so there's plenty of time for Clovis people to have occupied the site. Uh, we really want to evaluate the likely effects of humans and or this possible extraterrestrial impact on the local environment, megafauna extinction, at the end of the Pleistocene. And the evidence from the core data, again, uh, we're working on that now. Uh, we've got some of the data back, and we hope to publish that uh, in Science Advances or something like that in early 2019. And finally, uh, I was lucky enough, uh, Tom, some of you may know Tommy Charles. Uh, he's in his, he's, I think he's in his 80s now. He's retired. He worked tirelessly for years going around South Carolina documenting private collections in virtually every county in, in South Carolina, thousands and thousands of points. In fact, I think we wound up using almost 90,000 points to produce the, the maps that are, you'll see in the book, the GIS interpolation maps. So just an incredible resource. It goes through all the various types, as Tommy has seen over the years. Uh, this is available on Amazon. Uh, the money goes to support archaeological work in the upstate of South Carolina. And then also worked with Al Goodyear. We published an edited volume recently, the University of Florida Press. This will be available at the Southeastern Archaeological Conference. You can also go on the University of Florida Press website. If you use SEAC 18, you can get a, a discount. You get the discount price. This is a hardback. You can see it. It's on the table, on the piano over here, if you'd like to look at it. But there's 15 authors, Dave Anderson, uh, all kinds of people. Really incredible work. So we're really proud of that. Uh, if any of you are interested, let me know. Uh, thank you. For the blood residue work? Yeah. yeah. Some of the, from Flamingo Bay, we went in and excavated with the explicit intent on recovering stuff that had not been touched. Yeah, but then you, you also mentioned the uh, blackness. That's right. That's right. That, they were that's right. Absolutely. The, the caveat there is, you know, they were touched. But for, to do the work on any, any significant number of Paleo-Indian points, we have no choice. So did it, did it there's always the possibility of contamination. Uh, you know, we didn't find any extinct elephant, you know, or mastodon or mammoth on there, so, but we did find plenty of evidence of bison. There's potential for contamination, but it's very consistent with the results that we got on all of the artifacts that were not touched and not handled. So ideally, we would want to use ones that were never handled and touched, absolutely. There's been, I think there's been more blood residue work done out west. And there they actually have got some evidence of extinct megafauna on some of the Clovis uh, tools out, out, out there. To my knowledge, there's never been, there's been blood residue, there's been very limited work done. Uh, there's blood residue work was done at Cactus Hill. They found bison. It wasn't really, it was in the appendix of the Cactus Hill report. It was never put out in a journal article, so it's not well known. The Williamson site. In Virginia, they got bison. Again, no extinct megafauna. Now in Florida, they looked at bowling points. Same thing. Uh, they got bison there. They got you know all the normal species, deer, that kind of thing. Um, but and I think this is I don't know if this has been reported, but Dennis Stanford, one of the uh, one of these by points, which I have a, a cast on the table up here, from the Delmarva Peninsula site, so that Darren Lowry has been finding these artifacts. One of those bipoints tested positive for camelid or camel. 
And I think that might be in one of Danis's books, but it hasn't been published in peer review. And if that's true, that's the first artifact I know of in the East that has come back with extinct megafauna. But absolutely, the pre stuff needs to be tested. Um, I mean, I know that a lot of people are skeptical of, of the blood residue. Uh, we, we had to deal with that. We published an article in American Antiquity in 2016, and we, we sort of had to deal with that. But it is what it is. And I, I, would, I will just say that the, you know, trying to be careful and, and excavate artifacts without touching and testing those and getting really interesting results. One thing I didn't mention is that Flamingo Bay, we find these little uh, polished stones or gastroliths, gizzard stones that birds ingest, right? We started finding these things and we're like, wow, they look like teeth, but they're stones, they're polished stones. We found large numbers of them, so we knew that the, there's evidence of mass processing of waterfowl at Flamingo Bay. Well, the blood residue results that we got back with totally blind, came back with wild turkey on artifacts, uh, grouse and quail, you know, so things like that give you, you know, give me at least a little bit of faith that, that, the, that the method works. And so I think it's definitely something that should be explored. I, most of the ones that I've tested have been the, you know, the coastal plain chert in South Carolina and Georgia. I've, I've got results on quartz. I've got results on the ortho quartzite Dalton, which kind of makes sense because it's probably more like a sponge than, you know, it's got a lot of voids, you know, within the rock that you wouldn't even have to have microfractures. The, you, that would be a mechanism for absorbing blood down into the stone. So I think the porous rocks maybe, you know, would have better chances. But I really can't answer it because we, most of the, what I've done has been on Coastal Plain Church. I'm sorry? It's, well, we're not really looking at DNA. It's an immunological technique. And so they're actually taking antibodies from living animals. And it's a method, uh, the electrophoresis technique they take the extract residues from the tools, insert them on one end, and they take the antibodies of modern animals. Like, for example, the, uh, they'll use, I think, either African or Asian elephant will react positive to a mastodon or a mammoth if it's there. And so they use those antibodies. And through this process, those antibodies will migrate in the direction of the residues if it's positive. So, but we're not actually, we're not actually extracting DNA. In fact, I've talked to some people in, in there's pro, they call them linear epitopes of protein. It may or may not have preserved DNA, but there's something there that elicits a positive immunological reaction. I've talked to people about, you know, can we, can we take these positive residues, can we find DNA? You know, if we get a positive residue, can we then take it and look for DNA? It's something I'm looking into. Uh, but that would be, yeah, that's really what's needed is DNA. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Chris, for your, appreciate you coming down. Thank you.